the entertainment highlight of the week. Red Ray Gun Limited presents The Benji Nick Show. Hello. Oh, hello. How are you? I'm okay. Well, I, I suppose it's time for Loch Ness Royale. <laughs> What's Loch Ness Royale? <laughs> Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, good day. Good night. Good evening. <laughs> good tidings we bring. To you and the king. Goodness. Loch Ness. I'll give it you. But I win you. because I'm the queen. <laughs> Oh, you yeah. were doing. See, you were doing. You were doing sort of royalty. Yes. Whereas what I was doing? doing Casino Royale kind of. Well, you got Roger oh, Moore. Oh, I see. You, know, you got yeah. Pierce Brosnan there. Who talks about. <laughs> oh, I had oh. no idea what you do. <laughs> you notice that whenever Pierce Brosnan in the Bond films is hurt, yes. he always makes that. He makes this noise. He goes. Oh. He's like, oh. <laughs> Remember it so well because he always used to talk. Bond. James Bond. It's all very restrained. Which sounds a little bit like Prince Charles, doesn't it, you know? Yeah, it's, I thought uh, you were doing Prince Charles. <laughs> sort of nanotechnology, really. You know, it's, well, yes, it's jolly good, jolly good. Well, um, this is the Benji and Nick show. Mm. And uh, what we do is we talk about cult television. And uh, we often set ourselves a programme to watch and then chat about it week afterwards or we sometimes do a bit of commentary exclusively so far on doctor who or sometimes we just talk about the television we've been watching this week that's what we're doing mm, uh, if yeah. we're lucky we might just catch jamie anderson son of jerry anderson for a chat on facetime which works particularly well on audio <laughs> <laughs> the magic of uh, technology uh, did i say that i'm not benji yes and i'm not nick Oh. But welcome, welcome. This is our, our fun little place. Yes, of course, Jamie uh, Jamie Anderson, he, he may be busy and important or we won't be able to get hold of him. We couldn't get hold of him last week. Let's just wait and see. That's going to be exciting, isn't it? Mm. And at the end of it all, we'll <laughs> surprise you and ourselves by deciding what we're going to be talking about uh, next week. I wrote this week, but I mean next week. Um, it's so always, uh, you know, you never know. That's the beauty of it, isn't it? Even we don't know. Right now, no, we don't no, know. Literally no idea. So before we talk about our latest TV joys, here are some of your emails sent to podcast at nicholasbriggs.com. Shall mm, I um, yeah, go for read, it, my read this enormous email? Is this the one? Oh, no, no, you read this one. I'll do the, the biggie in the middle. <laughs> Okie dokie. So the subject of this one is the films and shows that disappear. And that was uh, sent at 12.44, good year, uh, on the 13th of the 11th, 2019. And it is from Kenneth Mann. Ah, oh, Kenneth. Um, I was reminded indirectly by your podcast about When Eight Bells Toll, of the phenomenon of films that seem to exist only in our memories. Oh. Thank heavens for the internet, as often this is the only place you can find evidence that some of the things you remember seeing weren't just a dream <laughs> my list includes they only kill their masters starring james garner oh. saw it as the b movie with soylent green oh. uh, not seen a trace of it anywhere since goodness have you ever seen soylent green no i'm oh. not no. i would recommend I've it, you i've yeah. never seen it okay yeah. we've got looker here starring albert finney and looker. james coburn looker i don't wonder what that's looker. about yeah it's about a cooker with an L instead of a C. Oh, um, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, Runaway, starring Tom Selleck. I know this uh, one. Those last two, uh, both directed by Michael Crichton. So how can they be obscure? But they are. And should you want another interesting film to discuss, I would suggest Colossus, The Forbin Project from 1970. I'm sure the score by the French jazz musician Michael Colombert uh, would be worth Benji's time, as the plot of the film involves a computer taking over the world, but the director told his composer that as the machine is an impersonal threat, his music should avoid painting it as evil or sinister. Uh, 
That director was Joseph Sargent, who uh, has the distinction of having directed both The Taking of Pelham 123 and Jaws The Revenge. Make of that what you will. Yeah, well, that one's a brilliant film sounds... and, and the other one's a terrible film. A video nasty, yeah. But Colossus, the Forbin project, sounds very much up my strata. Yeah. So I will certainly look into that. Let's hope it's still... Now, again, let's hope it's still... Uh, there's any trace of it out there. I hope well, so. I seem to remember it has a... The, the robot has a voice like a, a 1960s Cyberman, you know, sort of thing. I don't know. Which is an absolute winner for me, because Chicken it's dinner. my favourite voice. You know. I don't think Jaws the Revenge was a video nasty mate you know mm, it wasn't the best though was it no it was terrible uh <laughs> it was video a, terrible uh video Luca, terrible yeah look as a, a, a an american science fiction film written and directed by michael crichton and starring albert finney and james coburn the film is a suspense science fiction piece that comments upon this and satirizes media advertising tv's effects on the populace and a ridiculous standard of beauty interesting oh i love a ridiculous standard of beauty isn't that weird? I just want. The, mm. Okay, and um, the other, th- the interesting thing about Runaway. Have you seen that? No. Uh, the uh, the score is by Jerry Goldsmith. Oh, come but on! But it's played entirely on Yamaha keyboards. <laughs> really? Mm. What year would that have been? Like the late eighties or, or yeah, mid to late eighties. Yeah, DX seven. The X7. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, so I, love sounds... I love the Yamaha keyboard. So, so it's the, all the, the Jerry Goldsmith style of composing, but all of it <laughs> all the time. Well, it was yeah. a lot like his, that was like the, the early Star Trek stuff, isn't it? You know, for the next gen, it was all very kind of synthesized. Mm. Next up from Brendan Wright, uh, subject Irrelevance. Uh, sent at 0748 on the 11th of the 11th, uh, 2019. Uh, dear Nick and Benji. My birthday. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Congratulations on making it. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> dear Nick and Benji, after growing up in an era where it was thought there was a proper way to pronounce things, it's funny living in an age where we now know English is pronounced and spelt any way a group agrees to. Henceforth, I shall stick to the archaic spelt because it's just as good and I like it. In spite of knowing this, it's interesting how upsetting some pronunciations can be. An emotional response comes up in one's throat in spite of knowing the correct way is wrong. Homage and aqua, for example, with their various pronunciations, bring tears to my eyes and make me know that I'm a complete prat. (laughs) When we celebrate the glorious freedom that English has, because it's alive and is oblivious of authorities, why does it upset us so much at the same time? I hunted out a bit of etymology of those two tricksy words and found some pointless facts. Homage or homage. In the entertainment industry, the French word pronounced homage is spelt homage with two M's. While there's an English word with one less M and is pronounced the plain old vulgar English way with the hard idge sound. It's had the H2 since the 18th century, but in American they still drop the H on it, like Parker would. Homage! Originally, all of our 16th century Norman H words had soft H's, so dropping the H was good and proper back then it only is on some words now like air and hour and edge og sometimes (laughs) there's a i'm not doing a very good job of reading this out there's a funny story in the bill bryson book about when our norman rulers returned to paris their french was considered so rural they were mortified Returning to Britain, they decided to return the peasants' language to being the official lingo. During the few years the ruling class spoke French, the English language, left in the hands of common folk, made a rapid and irreversible evolution which wouldn't have happened under authoritarian control. Mm. Now, whether you have drowned in this missive or have just wetted your palate, here's the other interesting word which often gets watered down by them what speak it. Aqua. Aqua came straight to England from Latin and was always pronounced by Romans, Englishmen and mad dogs as aqua. I'm assuming aqua and aqua 
must have come from the Spanish influences in, in America, though the Spanish spell it with a G and not a Q. At any rate, the word we use today never passed through the Bay of Biscay, Spanish waters of course, agua, before English. My children still say Aquaman and can't <laughs> be convinced otherwise. Well, because it comes from the American saying, doesn't it? I'm glad English is so unruly, even though it upsets my poor beating heartsies at times. There's one sexy enough pronunciation I've never heard before, the Benji and Nick show, and I'd love to know where it generally lives. Is there a regional origin of sixth as opposed to sixth? Hmm. I imagine I've never heard it before because of BBC broadcastery law and so forth. Bill Bryson's book on the mother tongue was a real good one and made me realise how brilliant and beautiful and silly our language is. Suits us, really. Bestest wishes, Bren Doon, sent at 25.73 non-standard time. <laughs> yes, sixth. It's sixth. I think I end up saying sixth. sixth I, I, I say sixth, some, sixth, sixth sometimes because I, I think it's, if you want to speak rapidly, sixth is quite hard to, yeah. to say quickly, isn't it? I mean, it's quite hard yes, to say anyway. I, I, love, I love the language and uh, I, I find it fascinating. In fact, this morning, there was a great video I stumbled across on YouTube um, where it was uh, a conversation with an Anglo-Saxon. And um, it was a, the interviewer was speaking in English. An Anglo-Saxon? What do you mean? So basically, somebody uh, was speaking in, as how we would have spoken once upon a <sighs> once upon a time. And so it's very interesting to see how different languages, but also the traces of original language that are in there. Like uh, it's just things as things are similar but not quite. But uh, it's it's well worth a look. I mean, it's all complete gibberish, but. Where's um, that again? I'll double check it's called that. Um, Where did you say you... you interview with heard? an Anglo-Saxon in Old English, and you can find that on YouTube. Oh, and it's all just YouTube. complete... It's, it's very good, though. Very good. Complete rubbish, but very good. Well, we've got another one here. Um, this is a mm. new message from Robert Feld, sent 2158 on uh, the 8th of the 11th. Ah. After the Dalek invasion? Ah, yes, 2058, where we all started wearing flares, finally, after a million years of 60s fashion. Um, <laughs> hello, I'm a major fan of your work, but that's no reason why I'm calling. I was wondering if you knew about, uh, if you know about a 1990s BBC TV show known as Crime Traveller, where two people used a ramshackle time machine to solve crimes. It only lasted one season before it was cancelled, and it never achieved its full potential. After listening to the Space 1999 audio drama you wrote, uh, I was wondering if you could take a look at Crime Traveller and see if it deserves an audio reboot. Thank you, Robert Fell. Well, uh, you've heard of Crime Travel, have you? Certainly have, yeah. Lots of Doctor Who references in there as well. Are there I mean, it was hated. Hated. I, I, remember, I don't think it was uh, that bad. Uh, well, I did. I really hated it. I think we all hated it because it wasn't Doctor Who. There was a TARDIS in there. They had the police what? box in there. There was a police did box they? in there. Yeah, yeah. It had Michael French in it, didn't it? Who mm. was um, a big star after EastEnders, and it was his next big vehicle. And, um, yeah, we, the country was just not ready for crime travel. I remember uh, SFX ran an article saying they used to give a second chance to much maligned series and do an article about them and reappraise them. And they did one, and it, the, and it was a right-hand page in the magazine, and it said, you know, let's look at, you know, crime traveler again and then you turn the page and it just said no way <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of the article <laughs> it either said no way or something even more rude than that yeah i don't think it was that bad i mean it wasn't it was nothing sensational but it, but it wasn't well, we should give it a go shouldn't we Maybe. i mean is it available on dvd let's have a look yeah you can get oh. it for 15 quid from world of books hmm well that's something to consider anyway it certainly um, is, yeah but now to our main topic, which is, uh, I just, uh, did you see, I put the cover, Colin Smith's Very lovely nice. cover in there, just to uh, show some of the things we were going to talk about. What would you like to talk about that you've been watching recently? Do you know, I've um, been to see Midway 
at the cinema. Oh, yeah. Um, which is, uh, I went to see it, yeah, last week. At the, my first time at our new cinema, which was a thoroughly pleasant experience, actually. Brand new cinema, great sound, superb, massive screen, comfortable seats. Wow. Um, now, the film is, of course, right up my strasse. It's about the battle What is of, it about, for those who do Oh, God. It's sorry. about the Battle of Midway um, in World War Two, a clash between the Japanese and the Americans, um, and arguably a moment which really did turn the tide of the Pacific War, really. Um, now, I've always known about it, but I can't say that I've... You know, I've never seen anything that particularly depicts Midway. Yeah, there um, is a film called Midway, which was the original... Was years ago, wasn't it? There is it? a film... Yeah. Yeah, but this this is the new one at the cinema right now at the Kino, uh, right now. Um, and I have to say, actually, for a flick, it was very fun, very good. It's about two hours long, um, and it was one of those ones where, okay, you know, it was the writing in it. Um, it wouldn't mm. set your heart on fire with emotion, and you know, who made it? Who's the writer and director? Let me have a look for you because I don't often take that much notice when it comes to films. Um, well, they don't tell you anymore. It all comes up at the end, doesn't it? They don't tell you at the beginning of a film anymore. So this film was um, directed and produced by Roland Emmerich. I, I thought as much, right. And written by Wes Took. <laughs> yes, people are not known for their subtlety, yes. Well, quite. It's, it's they did Pearl Harbour as well, didn't they? Roland Emmerich did t Pearl Harbour too. Which pretty much, this film touches on, it does Pearl Harbour at the start anyway. Um, yeah, well, this is, it's this is like the revenge for Pearl Harbor in a way, isn't it? It is, but but I mean, do you know what though? It was one of those ones. I mean, the characters in it are fairly, fairly sort of stereotypical what you'd expect characters. But it's actually a really good film. I really enjoyed it because it was sort of, you know, if you go in wanting a, a good war film with plenty of planes and at loads of action, my gosh, just loads of great action and explosions and aircraft well roland emmerich always delivers on that level absolutely you know you know absolutely really good at that kind of stuff and it, it gets i thought it was pretty good you know i sat there i mean i love aircraft anyway and i love sound and the sound design was superb in this film um and so to sit there and i mean what is interesting is is that it has a lovely bit at the end which i i thought was a really nice touch in which every single character appears and then they they compare them to the uh, original historical counterpart, hmm. um, which is actually really nice because you end up, you know, it means that when you've finished watching it, Nick's there brandishing a knife at me, um, <laughs> really. Um, what you see at the end is you, you actually think, oh, what this character did that seems so sensational here actually happened. And it's very much as a, yeah. the film very much has, as well as the action, it has a real emphasis on intelligence and and military intelligence and yeah, yeah. risks and, uh, and contradiction in terms. <laughs> um, I will. I will certainly make an effort to go and see it this week. I might. Yeah. I think I it's, a, it's, drive, it's drive over to Dorchester and go and see it at the Plaza. It's worth. A, it's definitely worth a go. You know, if you if you go in there and think I want to see an action film, you will love it. If you go in there and you think I want to see a film like Dunkirk, which is all about the emotion and the horrors of war, um, then you'll come out disappointed. They're two very different animals. I think. It's a bit more gung ho, is it? A little bit. I mean, it's still, yeah. I mean, it's it's just a lot of action. It's a lot of a lot of fighting, and a lot of expensive computer graphics and all that business. Hmm. Lots of, and then, and you know lots of boats and submarines as well, and ships and aircraft carriers and all that business. Okay, well, you've convinced me to go and see it. Uh, I um, shall I mention a few things? Mm, go for it. Bizarrely, since I've been massively busy this week, I seem to... Of course, I've been watching things the previous week, but I've got quite a few things to talk about. So, I mean, his Dark Materials, Colin's writ large on our, our cover there, uh, you know, a major BBC adaptation of Philip Pullman's uh, series... Uh, trilogy, isn't it? Yes, of books. Um, it's and interesting, you know, they tried to make a film of it, but it uh, and they did make a film of it, but it kind of got killed at the box office because it does have certain uh, criticism. The, the, the basis of the novels is uh, an intellectual criticism of organised religion, and and this made it um, it garnered uh, an unfairly um, irreligious, blasphemous. Um, reputation in america and you really if something has got anything to do with blasphemy 
uh, in America, it's just not going to fly at the box office, or rather the distributors will be so concerned about it not doing very well in the Bible Belt that they'll pull all proper marketing from it and, and kind of consign it to the waste paper bin, I would say. I, suppose, that's I think you why have the, to, the, if the, you're making a film like that, though, you have to take that on board straight away from the off and not expect it to, to become a... The, you know, the world at the moment is, is that it's just not going to be picked up, is it, in the same way as a film about... Well, who knows what... Ducks, you know... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but they but they must have thought that this is such a successful series of novels it's worth doing as a film anyway so the, with the film they had to put a stupid nonsense glending on the end of the first book as it were whereas with this tv series uh, adapted by the bbc with i think loads of money on co-production i can't imagine the bbc could afford to make this entirely themselves um you know there there seems to be a commitment to make the full trilogy and I think they're already drawing in story elements from other books. The thing that's confusing, in case you don't know, it's about um, alternative dimensions, really. And it starts on an alternative dimension, Earth, which is similar to our own, but sort of primitive. Or it's, it's, well, There are airships and um, people have demons. Their, their sort of inner soul is represented by a small animal or, or a large animal, in some people's cases, that sort of represents their personality and follows them around all the time, but isn't is sort of physically there but not physically there sometimes it's there and sometimes it isn't it's very mystical but it, but interestingly the story is rooted in in trying to explain a kind of alternative science so it seems very hard-edged and nuts and bolts mm. um i loved the books and i'm not a great reader but I, they absolutely caught my imagination and i devoured them i remember india fisher um master chef india fisher charlie pollard india fisher and i sort of racing to read the last book together you know what I mean? And we were sort of, where are you now? What's just happened in yours? And we were on a train journey together and she was slightly ahead of me. I know she's saying, oh, you'll never guess what happens. <laughs> I go, no, don't tell me, don't tell me. So um, so it's a very important series of books to me, even though I felt that the last book was a bit overlong and flaccid. This often, ha often happens with these things, doesn't it? Because the writer attains more status and people are less likely to edit them. It's just like me at Big Finish. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway... Um, so very very important to me and i remember i don't know whether i've ever said this to you benji but when i read the first book i remember thinking goodness me if they ever think of making a movie or a tv series of this they're going to have real trouble because the person who plays lyra who is the heroine of the first book really and features in all the books uh, is the big continuing character really she is so extraordinarily written as a character she is engaging she's she's magical she's just incredible i thought they are never going to be able to find a young actor who can sufficiently embody this and in the movie they got someone who was you know pretty okay and in any other movie about any other thing you thought yeah pretty okay but she wasn't remarkable and the sorry fact is that with this tv series although the actor concerned she is very good she's just there's nothing remarkable about her and that that leaves a sort of saggy hole in the middle of it for me which seems like an awful thing to say because it's such a beautifully made series and and as i say she is good she has got nothing to be ashamed of it's a, she acquits herself well um i hear that they're rushing to make the rest of it because she's growing up quickly <laughs> yeah that's, that's not problem, appropriate for the story um and um other great performances in it james mcavoy and um ruth thingamajig <laughs> Well, I, I love Ruth Thingamajig. She's great, Ruth Thingamajig. She was great in old uh, the uh, Doobie flop, wasn't she? In the, you know, the oh, old, amazing. Yeah. Anyway, so in spite of being inevitably disappointed by Lyra, it's not half bad, and I love the story. So, but the bizarre thing is, the BBC have shown two parts of it, and now, and they keep saying there's more, and now they've stopped because yeah. it's going to be War of the Worlds tomorrow. Oh, of course. Is that tomorrow, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it starts tomorrow. So I'd be interested to see that with Peter Harness's version. Interestingly, he has created a character called Amy to be the wife of the main character, and I did exactly the same thing in my adaptation, which came out before. It's called The Martian Invasion of Earth, and you can get it at bigfinish.com. Mm -hmm. Pluggy, yeah. pluggy, pluggy, why not? I mean, I think he used the name Amy because that was the name of H.G. Wells's wife. Makes sense. I 
plucked the name Amy out of the air and then looked up and I thought, or oh, maybe I should give it the name of H give her the name of H. G. Wells' wife and found out that she was Amy. I think it might have been his first wife. But how strange though. I came to weird. it by different means, isn't it weird? Because I thought that's a nice Victorian sort of name. That is very strange. Now I'm looking forward to seeing that and certainly Yeah. You know, Apparently it's, it's really depressing and hard hitting. That's what we like. I'll quickly run through other things that I've been watching. I watched the reboot of Lost in Space again. I've got to about part seven and enjoying it even more than before. And then my family has started watching it. It occurred to me my son is just a year younger than Will Robinson. <laughs> uh so and he's watched two, maybe three episodes and absolutely loves it. So I must uh, get good. them to watch that more. That's good. I was lured into watching the first free episode of For All Mankind, the Apple TV thing. They gave, give you that for free to, to make you subscribe to Apple TV. And uh, I thought, that's good. And then, bizarrely, it offered me episode two for free as well. And I watched that. And that's good. But I thought, do I want to spend four ninety nine a month just to find out what happens? No. So I'll never find out what happens in For All Mankind. Even though that was the, the Russians got to the moon first alternative history story very good yeah I mean, actually this is a good moment to, to mention um britbox because oh, I've, yes. I've been because obviously britbox came out uh, in the uk uh, the other day um i think it was last week and i got i've got the the trial I, i've i've had a little explore me I thought too it, thought it would be good and i'm gonna be brutally honest here and i'm gonna say what an absolute colossal waste of time there's nothing <laughs> there's just nothing in there that isn't on anything else. And unless they mm. pull things from Netflix and, and Prime, um, then, then quite frankly, what is the point? And I've, I want to voice this as a bit of a rant because I'm getting so fed up of everybody, every single company now, um, starting these monthly things where you have to pay for it monthly. Because it gets to the point where I was looking through yesterday and thinking, I subscribe to so many pointless things per month because they're, mm -hmm. not, they're not offering things in another way. You know, do I want to? Do I want to to now pay for Netflix and BritBox to watch the things that yeah. are on Netflix already? Yeah, but I would say that there's loads of things on BritBox that are not on Netflix. I've watched films that are not. You know, they don't have the old films, the old war films and things. But the the old war films, are the types of things that you they're on all the time everywhere else, really, and they're all, all they're on Prime. Yeah, but you have to wait for them, don't you? That's a, and aren't you not persuaded by Doctor Who coming on Boxing Day? You know, they're going to have all the classic Doctor Who episodes. I mean, this is the thing. I don't know what to to think about that. Pay four ninety nine a month to save yourself the trouble of reaching for a DVD. But I mean, the thing is, though, I'm in the process of digitising all of my DVDs anyway, so they'll all be on my Plex. And so for me, it it's it doesn't really change my life too much. Um, I like the idea of it, and you know, for those who haven't got the DVDs, I think that's terrific. What what I think they need to do for 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 me. To, to really be good is to start delving into their archives more which i hope and i uh, assume that's what they'll do i'd love to see some of the kind of play for today stuff and the trouble is benji me too but i don't think that's i bet their market research shows that that is not what people want i'm you know, sure they want the sheridan smith collection they want stuff like that they're going for popular big stuff yeah i'm sure that's I'm sure why that's there's the not case. a streaming service for talking pictures because there's n you know we're in a minority of sados say that though <laughs> talking pictures was number five most watched um digital channel number five was it really yeah i, I heard that the other day absolutely insane yeah, but that still means it will only get viewing figures of a few hundred thousand yeah but it's i suppose so but you know in, in, a, in a world where that's competing with in a world in a world where it's competing with itv the bbc and sky uh, and channel four i think number five or whatever is pretty decent you know yeah it's pretty decent but it's not that impressive it's, it's not yeah I, I i know what you mean i mean ultimately it's not impressive enough to pay for a whole new streaming service the, and, and i think equally you know that's the same with britbox I, I don't feel there's enough on there to to really make me want to uh you know I, I don't want to pay x amount of money to watch 40 towers on another platform you know i think somebody yeah. well, said well you might Twitter, find that they start being withdrawn from the other platforms. and if they do that that becomes a game changer because then you think right well where can i watch these things that i like to watch because you know netflix i would say value for money here um 
for me personally, I don't tend to watch a lot of the American things on Netflix. I sometimes watch, I like no. the exclusives. I do enjoy those and things like, you know, like Stranger Things, The Good Place and stuff like that. Yeah, but yeah. ultimately, you know, um, a lot of the other stuff from watching BBC-ish things and ITV-ish things when they pop up. So it's one mm. to watch, but I would say, I, I would just say that um, what I would have done if I was, if I was the BBC would probably have launched it with all the Doctor Who's on launched it with something that makes it feel special yeah, why and unique. Can't they? There must be some con- contractual reason why not. I know why they've done it, because they want people to t- have the free trial, and then by the time Doctor Who comes, they'll be paying. Yeah, well, ab- I mean, it rather makes Rather than people perf- having a free month of Doctor Who and then stopping. Absolutely it's like people sense. getting a free Netflix subscription just to watch The Crown. Which I'm sure people do. Um, well, that's exactly what my mother-in-law's done for both <laughs> series of The Crown. She's just taken the free option both times for both series and got out before she got charged. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you can't you can't blame her for that. So I, I would say no. it's, it's certainly one where, um, you know, I'm interested. I'm intrigued and I'm interested. Uh, for now, in its current form, I wouldn't pay for it. I would not pay for it at all. Um, but let's see what they bring into it, you know, in the future. That's my thoughts. No, I, I, I like the idea of it, but I haven't watched anything all the way through yet. I've not, no, I've not either. There's nothing on there that... I didn't see anything and think, oh, I really want to watch that. You know, I thought, oh, I've, I saw that not long ago. You know, I saw they've, they've got Cracker on there. You know, and that what that was on other things, and I watched that recently on DVD. But that was Cracker was the only thing that I thought, oh, that's not on anything else. That's interesting in terms yeah. of telly things. Except a DVD on your shelf. Yeah, which, yeah, exactly. <laughs> There you go. We're in quite a serious mood, aren't we? Yeah, well, it's, well, it's the weather, isn't it? It's one of those, you know, it's a serious serious day, isn't it? What's that thing, seasonally adjusted disorder or something? Sad. Sad, something. yeah, sad. Sad. I would well, say well, it certainly affects me. I get very much affected by the uh, the outside world. It's quite sunny here at the moment. I can see clouds rising now in the West Country here. It's quite It often is, isn't it? Like, oh, when I think of the West Country, I think of sunshine. Do you? Yeah, I do, yeah. Hmm. It's ironic given that I live in a place that's that has the tagline The Sunshine Coast. Although I've not seen a lot of that lately. Um, well, I mean, ours is called the Jurassic Coast and I haven't seen any <laughs> dinosaurs recently. Oh, I wish there was. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Uh, talking of dinosaurs, I was... Uh, uh, <laughs> so, so, talking of dinosaurs, I'm going to phone J- Jamie Anderson. Jamie. Not at all. <laughs> We've not reached there yet. Um, my wife has uh, um, a Japanese friend, Sayo, who j- came over to visit recently. And uh, she and, and her husband are really into Godzilla. Okay. And so I, I found myself telling her a story about... Because uh, my friend John Ainsworth used to... Uh, I was going to say make me watch, but that's unfair. Uh, play me um, <laughs> Godzilla movies. And, of course, a lot of them have been dubbed quite badly. And... Uh, on one of the Godzilla movies, there's a bit where Godzilla has clearly, I think, sort of destroyed a ship or something. And then the people back at HQ are listening to the recording of the last transmission from the ship. And you can hear someone going, oh, no, we are being attacked. And you hear <laughs> coming on in the background. And then they say, it looks like some kind of enormous dinosaur. And um, the... Uh, the guy says, now, obviously, in the Japanese original, the word dinosaur was sort of heavily covered in static and sound effects. And so it was difficult to hear. But the, the dubbing studio didn't bother with that. You just heard the bloke saying, it looks like a dinosaur. <laughs> as clear. And then the, the other character goes, wait, stop the tape. Play that back. And he goes, it looks like a dinosaur. <laughs> Hold on. What did he say? <laughs> they play it back again. Dinosaur. He said, did he say dinosaur? <laughs> and he's clearly said dinosaur three times. It's not, it's not a word you no... can mistake for something else, is it? But it, obviously it's meant to sound like... <laughs> you to read. And then he goes, hold on, is that dinosaur? But so John and I, we have this joke that if anyone ever says dinosaur, he or <laughs> I'd say, um, did, sorry, did you say dinosaur? <laughs> and what we think it's immensely funny and other people just go... Yeah, I did say dinosaur. What, <laughs> why are you asking? And why, why is that now suddenly funny? 
<laughs> so I explained this to Sia and her husband, who bizarrely has the surname Briggs. So she's become a Briggs now. He met me. He's American. He said, hello, Mr. Briggs. <laughs> so there we are. No relation. Well, possibly once upon a time back in the uh, 16th century. Um yeah, but I kept making that dinosaur joke because we went around the Natural History Museum <laughs> and they say, kept saying that. And I said, did you say dinosaur? And she'd say, yes, I did. And I said, no, I'm, I'm doing that joke. I'm doing, I'm doing the gag. <laughs> Let's keep explaining. She's going, oh, yes, yes. Anyway. Reminds me of that. There's a, I'm sure, I think it was long anyway, um, there was a evolution of of Godzilla's roars or something that I remember watching for ages oh, back then. Yeah. It was it was really quite. I don't know why I was that that bothered to watch it, but um, it was quite amusing. That's all I remember. I used to love the noise of it roar. You know, it's roaring thing. Yeah. Back in the day. Can you do an impersonation of Godzilla's? Well, roar? it always had that bit. So it does a kind of you know. Rah, Oh, that's it's like the bit at oh, the that's end, like isn't, it? <laughs> isn't it? It's like that yes, weird... that's right. I knew there was something in particular about it. Yeah, that's that's my impression. <laughs> Did I? I don't know whether I mentioned last week when I mentioned that I'd been watching Lost in Space that the episode I've just watched is where Will si- suddenly, because everyone says the robot's deadly. And he, he he has become best friends with the robot. And it's really difficult for me to talk about this bit without getting quite teary. He takes the robot to a cliff and asks it to walk off. And it does. And it destroys itself. And before it goes, though, Will says, you're my best, you're the best friend I've ever had. And he's in absolute tears when he says it. Oh, <laughs> it's just it's doing it to me now. Wrecks me. It's it's a fantastic performance. You see, there the boy in Lost in Space is extraordinary. And if only the girl who played Lyra in his Dark Materials were three quarters even as extraordinary as he is, then I would be satisfied because he it is a an amazing performance by the boy. You know, because the original Lost in Space became all about the boy and the robot and Doctor Smith. Uh, I would just say the original series is virtually unwatchable now because it is such rubbish i did by the way look up there was a reboot of lost in space that was done in i think 2009 or something and it never got to the screen oh really but on youtube there's yeah it's really interesting I remember they did that um, dreadful film back back way back when well i quite liked it so no there's nothing nothing with matt leblanc in it yeah, yeah. nothing sensational it wasn't entirely successful i'll i'll, I'll give you that <laughs> Good fun, though. This, this is yeah. So the the reboot from two thousand and nine was very. Uh, I, I can see why they decided not to uh, stick it on the telly. On telly, because it because it wasn't that good. No, what 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 else is on your list? Um, well, I suppose I should refer to the things that were actually on the on the. Uh, There's poster. the good place. The Good Place, yeah. Well, Good Place, we're on uh, the final series of it now. And Did it's you really call it The Good Place? The Good Place. The Good Place, yeah. Yeah. Because you said The Good Place. Yeah, I was just, I was just sort of, you know, it's only, you know when you say, like, um, going over there and over there. You know, like, you just, just I just... Was, I was just, I'm very into emphasis on titles because I often get it wrong. No, 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 I don't really know why. I just, I just said it without thinking, is the truth on yeah. the matter here. Yeah, but, that's um, interesting, though, because... Yeah, it's on. in its final form, you know, the final series now, or season. Mm-hmm. Um, is it really? They've said it's the final one. Yeah, they're finishing it, they're leaving it on a high. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's an afterlife comedy, folks, in case you haven't seen it. Yeah, it's all about, if you don't know what it's about, um, it's essentially about, you know, people waking up and finding that they're in the equivalent of heaven only to find out that they shouldn't they're not meant to be there and it's a very well it's a very well written uh, piece largely around ethics and philosophy and kind of working around that that basis of what makes us human and what defines doing good and bad things and but it's very silly isn't it it's very silly it's good it's really funny um i've i've got real mixed uh, views on this uh, on the latest season of it because i've has really it changed it hasn't changed i've just feel feel like it's uh until until about halfway through i felt like it was really just uh it had lost its magic because it was just sort of very similar to everything else we'd seen before um, ah, right. you know and it was it, it just felt me and there wasn't a lot of even though it, they were all there you weren't getting a lot of the all the characters together at 
you know, all the time, which I was kind of part of it is that they all bounce off each other. And so it kind of felt for me, I was kind of losing a bit of, I thought, Oh, this is a shame. It's kind of hasn't got that magic, but, um, it's since halfway through has suddenly picked up again, which is really good. Um, Hmm. and will will it end up you know being a really i think a really iconic series in its own right because it's kind of quite thought provoking yeah so I, I did back into it now and again but i find it so i find it a bit relentless it can be a bit relentlessly it, juvenile at times which i find yeah, frustrating it's kind of being that way on purpose though mm. um it's very uh yeah it's very short 23 minutes an episode i like that good breakfast quick yeah, there you go. Not Anything else cupboard. from you? Um, I, I will. Well, I think I mentioned Survivors last week. Anyway, about the one yes. with Brian Blessed, which is good fun. You did. Um, yes. I've been watching a lot of Coronation Street again. I find that's kind oh, of my yeah. that's when when it's like weather <laughs> like this, and it's, um, and it's incredibly grim outside. I like to dip back into my old Corrie. So I'm up to 1980. Old Corrie. Old Corrie. Yeah, not new Corrie. And watch that. I'm touch that with a badge pole. Um, no, old, old Corey. So I'm on, yeah, 1987. I've been watching since wow. the 70s. Um, and I've made it all the way through. And I love it. I just find it's, it's such a, a lovely way of watching uh, the past in a weird way. Because it's kind of... Yes. But also a real masterclass. If anyone's listening, by the way, it's one of the, um, the two most popular British... Um, Soap operas. I nearly said sitcoms. Sorry, it's like the original Although soap, soap quite really, isn't it? You know, it's, you know, it's the original TV soap, so to speak. Certainly, well, the most from iconic. Britain, yes. Yeah, from Britain, longest running one about working class sort of northern street. Um, but the thing that really leaps at me um, is just the difference in the way in which television is nowadays compared to, compared to how it was then. The stories yes. in this are very basic, and it's kind of. It, there's a you know at the moment um a lad got drunk and broke into the corner shop and is keeping it from his friends meanwhile gail's had an affair with a bloke who who didn't want to be with her um and le- left for australia and mm. then um her mother I can't believe i'm having to listen to this no it's into her mother then um sent a letter to him to say look she's pregnant i think you should come back it might yes. be yours and so he just appeared out of the blue but the point and is she, he comes back on a kangaroo he does come back on a kangaroo with a with a hat <laughs> with corks hanging off it um but but the point <laughs> is is you know it wasn't all just car crashes and explosions and no. and death and murders and another murder on the street it's the fact that it was so simple but yet so yes. effective and you're so invested in the characters i'm really i love all the characters and i'm you know, and they're referring to events that happened like five or six years ago. That, and you think, but you're not thinking, oh, what's this? Because the characters are so reflective of all the events that happened to them. Whereas it feels now, I mean, I've lost complete touch with modern Coronation Street. And if there are any listeners out there who love it, then then please feel compelled to email in. But I just, I just got to a point where I'm a bit tired with the idea of kind of every week there's another person who's become a murderer or another explosion or the rovers burns down again or the factory burns the down again or somebody gives birth like the, was it quadruplets is is the latest one somebody not only gives birth to quadruplets but apparently gave birth to quadruplets whilst on like a ski lift and you just think just who who is thinking i mean i'm sure obviously it gets great viewing figures and so it does very well but i just think sometimes slower is better and i think it wouldn't work for the modern audience but for me i'm loving the fact that i can just sit for 20 minutes in the evening and feel comforted and infused by what's going on on kind of old telly you know lovely yeah i I don't think i could ever join you on that it's just too mundane for me but that's lovely i love to hear that you like coronation street i mean i like you know i like a lot of dull stuff i mean one of the dull things i've been watching a bit of recently and i can't even get through a whole episode of it it's so dull is voyage to the bottom of the sea (laughs) starring richard (laughs) basehart david hedison i mean it's just i used to love it as a kid i used to rush home from school to watch it but jeepers creepers what a load of twaddle um but beautifully made you know beautifully filmed rich colors there it is all on 35 millimeter lovely title um, sequence 
bong, bong. Big da, 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 But it is, da, da, da. it is funny, though, how as a kid you watch things and see them differently. It's like, as a kid, I used to think that Doctor No was this incredible action movie and it's so good and it's real James Bond. And I watch Doctor No back now and it's not a bad film at all. I mean, it's a good film. But I find it incredibly slow incredibly mm, dull mm. at times and I hate the music um, the music's yes. dreadful whereas as a kid I thought it was all just incredible and it was just as James Bondy as everything else yes well I must admit that I didn't see it until it was finally shown on British television and by then I was I think I was in my mid to late teens and I remember being shocked at how unimpressive it seemed although I do enjoy uh, watching it now I know my old acting course director is in the um the signals room receiving the uh, transmission at the beginning yeah. oh yeah the, oh, i like that bit yeah yeah maxwell shaw he's just there sort of saying here we are sir here we are sir yes <laughs> <laughs> is that the one where um i know that cause there's the secret bit where she folds the thing down and there's the computer and so he would have been in the other end of that wouldn't he i Something think like so yes. yeah Could i don't have. think it was a computer was it whatever it was computer. some radio unit <laughs> Radio and the other thing I saw last night as the first episode of Collateral, which I'd watched before by David Hare, one of Britain's foremost influential playwrights and also great screenwriter. And it's a fantastic drama starring John Sim and um, Billy Piper. And uh, But the reason I decided to watch it again is I just worked with an actor called Jeannie Spark on the big finishes I was recording last week. And uh, I thought, I want to see Jeannie Spark in something. So I typed her name into Netflix and up came Collateral. Mm. It's an int- It's about assassination and it's about uh, crime and it's about, well, it's the collateral damage of a particular murder that takes place and all the political and personal ramifications. It's a, it's a beautiful piece and I will watch it all again. And Jeannie plays um, uh, a very striking character in it. Um, but yeah, I, I thoroughly recommend watching Collateral on Netflix. It's, and ca- I should mention Carrie Mulligan, who I think is really the star of it. Of course, she's great playing a a police detective who's pregnant, <laughs> massively pregnant, uh, but she decides to take the case. But it's 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 just it's sublimely done. And Nicola Walker, I should mention, is in it as well. Just great actors. There's loads of reasons to watch it, really, aren't there? So a, a few actors in it who I've worked with. Hmm. So I think I'm out of things have you are you um i certainly i mean i watched crippin as well that's the only other thing i'd say oh, that you, I yes, yeah, you mentioned so, that. Yeah. and i've done the list yeah um it was on talking pictures tv quite liked it interesting more interesting about the fact that you know for years i always thought that dr crippin was some notorious murdering nasty man but mm. it turns out you know he was this film paints him in a completely different light as a long-suffering husband whose wife doesn't appreciate him who falls in love with a a lovely lady and accidentally um accidentally poisons his wife i say accidentally (coughs) he intends on doing it but then then sort of bottles it at the last minute but then accidentally he was meant to put something in her in her tea you see but he he puts a bit in her tea and then decides her tea you see the trades union congress that's exactly what he puts it in um but then he accidentally pours the excess amount into the sugar into the sugar (gasps) bowl and And then she she asks for plenty of sugar and he puts it in not knowing and kills her but it's the fact that that the you know it's the way he got caught was that i don't know if you know this but um no but basically the, the way he got caught is that he um he buried her in his cellar in his house and they mm. tried to escape to america because he was an american but so they went on a ship and he disguised the girl in which he loved he disguised her as his son you see uh-huh. and so she had his short hair and that anyway eventually they <laughs> they you know people saying look this bloke on here he does look a bit like dr crippen and his son looks a little bit like that woman that he's been hanging around with so subsequently (laughs) he was the first criminal to be caught via radio transmission and so so you know it's it's a sad thing he thought he'd get away with it what what's this available on that was on talking pictures tv uh, around the halloween time yeah but um so it's a film yeah. It's a film and it's quite and who's in it. It's got I can't remember his name because I only I always just think of him as my friend Chris Rogel because they look identical. Um, <laughs> um, um but the um the movie um oh god I can he's like one of our best actors but I just think of my friend um Donald Pleasance. 
Oh, Donald, so Donald Pleasant giving me a, with you, giving a wonderful performance in this because he he plays him so. You know, he's because Doctor Crippen's sort of he's long suffering. His wife is this horrible woman. Donald Pleasance is always creepy, and he's creepy in this. You know, he's he's incredibly sort of quiet because he's just got nothing to live for. And who's the woman? Who's the wife? And who's the uh, girlfriend? So um, the woman here, uh, Samantha Agar and Coral Brown. Oh, I don't know. I are the think. two? Um, there, I think some other Agar plays Ethel, his wife, and right. Coral Brown plays um, the love interest. But um, it's it's just a it's just a really really good film. It's kind of quite it's a bit slow, but I found myself sitting and just being really kind of uh, pulled into it because it's sort of it's sort of fifty percent what's going on and this man you know is suffering in his life and his romance and his and the other 50 percent is the court case afterwards where they're where they're in court trying him for murder yeah yeah but but it changed my thoughts i just thought this is interesting you know whereas you you brought up to kind of believe this is a man that was murdering relentlessly i think it was more of a this paints him as a man who suffered and made a mistake and fell in love and just wanted a better life but but murdered his wife, but <laughs> just that but she one was a, but, but she was a dreadful. Uh, she was a, a truly dreadful in this film. They really make her the most horrible woman you could ever possibly meet. Was it in made your by life. any of Doctor Crippen's um, relatives? This film? it certainly <laughs> seems that way. I mean, it paints him in a really good light. From the Doctor um, Crippen fan club, yeah. this entirely. <laughs> unbiased account of the poor Dr. Crippen who had no choice but to poison his annoying wife. Honestly, it, it might as well be. It <laughs> might as well be. But then, you know, I think it is a quite a, quite a belief that it, he... Yeah, it says, the crime... The poster here, the crime of the century. Was he really guilty? Oh. That's that's the tagline. So in other words, no, he wasn't, according to them. But yeah, that's, that's me done. So a very okay. weird mixture, I think this week yeah. it's um i know it's really frustrating when we go to jamie for you because you he can't hear you and i have to we keep... communicate with each other you see but i wonder whether do, do you want to invite him to this can you do that and get him to i can try So we're now joined by uh, Jamie Anderson, who's actually connected with Zoom, so it's a little bit better than usual. Hello, HD. Jamie. Hello. Well, it means I can hear Benji for a change rather than you <laughs> relaying it to me. So uh, hello. And then, having to, and then having to edit it. Yeah. Yeah, so that it sounds like it's, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's the magic of technology, isn't it? Look at this. And it's just now, future. what did you see on uh, Benji's shirts, Jamie? Uh, Benji had superimposed a picture of my face onto his <laughs> t-shirt which is really weird <laughs> it's quite fun isn't it yeah i like God, it it's, it's a very little, clever with the technology it's a little how trick. do you feel how do you feel about dr crippin jamie <laughs> i have no feelings at all about dr crippin you're not supportive of his uh, the injustice he suffered at the hands of his wife <laughs> <laughs> i uh, the blank stare from me, you know, is... He's a, you know, he's a famous poisoner, Dr. Crippen. Uh, not Did you really, know that? no, no. You you're, know that? you're educating oh. me. All oh, right. So please yeah. educate me. Well, Benji's enjoyed the film, haven't you, Benji? Yeah, watched the film, Donald Pleasance as, uh, as Dr. Crippen. There, um, killed his horrible oh. wife accidentally, although he was planning to kill her, but he sort of killed her accidentally, if that makes sense. I mean, he chickened out of it and then... Then then accidentally poured the poison into the sugar bowl and then poisoned her by making her a cup of tea. Um, nice! And then, and then fell in love with, with a younger woman, um, who then they... He, he decided then dressed to, up as a boy. He dressed up as a boy, and then they decided to emigrate to America, where, where the ferry was stopped... The ferry, the ship was stopped. Ferry, the ferry, ferry to America. Just the P&O to America. Uh, the, the ship was stopped halfway, and um, by radio they caught him. The first criminal to be caught uh, by radio transmission. Who would have thought today? Was he innocent? Amazing. Well, you know. well, um, what, what poison was used out of interest? Um, <laughs> Jamie's going to Jamie. Get <laughs> Sorry, to... That's a, that is not the question I thought you'd ask. It's very much the sort of question. I have got a related brief anecdote I can tell you, though. 
Yes. Which sort of might make up for me not knowing about it. That's how I look. So, Dr. Crippen, what? And I think I've already told you this, Nick. Ma- yeah. Many years ago, uh, Dad was in London. Yes. Uh, and he was going to a meeting somewhere at an office, and he was, he'd rung the doorbell at this office, and a bloke uh, in, in the street stopped him and said, Oh, hello, excuse me, I'm really sorry to, to disturb you. I know you're going somewhere, but I'm a huge, huge fan. Is there any chance you could do an autograph for me? So Dad said, oh, "Yeah, of course, no problem at all. Yeah, I, I'm, I've got to go in, so I'll just do the autograph and dash into the uh, into the meeting." So the guy gave him a bit of paper. Dad did the autograph, handed it over, and the guy looked quizzically at the bit of paper, and then said, "That that doesn't say Donald Pleasance." <laughs> <laughs> oh no! <laughs> so as as a fellow baldy. Dad was mistaken for Donald Pleasance, and that brought it back down to earth with a bang. I can see I it a little your bit, dad was about, I can see I, it. I, your dad was about two foot taller than Donald Pleasance, <laughs> I would have thought. Is that right? Yeah, hard to say. He was standing on a step going to the office, so maybe, I don't know. Anyway, there you go. Easily done. The, the poisoning question was hyacine. Oh. Which right, well, I don't even know what that is. Crystallised hyacine, which, was put, which looks a bit like sugar, I suppose. So, yeah, easily done. And now Hyacinth, I want to look at that, that famous comedy character, Hyacinth yeah. Bucket. Jamie is going to explain to everyone how <laughs> how Hyacinth works. No, I'm not. I don't think. I'm just want to. Uh, uh, I'm just interested. Sorry, that, I know it's not interesting to uh, most people. That's um, all right. That's 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 this podcast in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. It's actually a drug used to treat motion sickness and also post-operative nausea and vomiting. Because, of course, he was a doctor, wasn't he? He was a doctor. Overdose does cause unpleasant symptoms. Uh, Like death. Yeah. Dry mouth, death, uh, (laughs) urinary retention, photophobia. (laughs) Anyway. What, what, is that scared of light? Yes, I, I guess it's that light sensitivity. I love the way you went, dry mouth. Death. <laughs> <laughs> there may be some side effects. I mean, you might feel like a slight itching of your hand or death, or maybe your toe will hurt. <laughs> sort of in the wrong order, isn't it? Got to put it all in there. Well, so it, it that changed was my Dr. views Crippen. because I remember seeing Dr. Crippen oh, at the. Um, he's going to carry on. No, I was just going to say. I remember he, he was at the um, <laughs> at the Madame Two Swords thing. You know, Madame Two Swords. His, it seems like it doesn't really warrant him having his own statue, really. You know, he only killed one person, and even then, it was <laughs> even then he clearly wasn't very good at doing it because he. But he is a sort of. I mean, I learned about Doctor Crippen from my mum using the phrase, the, the word, the name, because he's a sort of byword for anyone who's suspected of poisoning, or or, or, or indeed anyone who's uh, suspected of plotting a murder. Mm. Oh, he's a bit Doctor Crippen, isn't he? You yeah, know? see, I'd go. He's a bit Doctor Sh- Doctor Shipman. Yeah, Dr. Harold Shipman, <laughs> the modern version. I've forgotten about Howard Shipman, yeah. yeah. Yes, he has <laughs> he superseded him. At, at least he, they've got footage of him. They used to always show slow-motion footage of him whenever they referred to his case, didn't they? Dr. Shipman talking to the camera and kind of doing a, don't, don't no, everything's fine, you know. <laughs> but then you slow-mo it and suddenly he looks like the devil. Which he might well have been. <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyway, moving on from these controversial masses. I, I talked about uh, his dark materials. Have you seen any of that? Oh, you have, haven't you? I've only seen episode one, and I and I was just not. I didn't enjoy it, so I haven't watched. You've not more. read the books, have you? No, I'm not. I'm not a his dark materials book person. So would that have changed my opinion of it? Do you think? I think it would have done. I think you know you're because the books are great, and I think you would have. St- I stayed with it because of the books. But the bizarre thing is, what are they doing? They've showed two new episodes, and now they've stopped because they're going to do War of the Worlds. What's going on? Oh, I don't know. I'm talking to you like you're the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I've got no idea. Point. No, it's very, Answer it's very strange. Answer the question. <laughs> oh. Don't avoid it. <laughs> or maybe his dark materials will come back for Christmas yes, with its, it's anti-religion a, message. Maybe it's an anticipatory hype-building exercise. Yeah. Well, it's because the BBC can only find one slot in which drama works, which is Sunday night. Well, that's a compl- That's not true. Or is it? Write in and let us know. Uh, <laughs> you haven't watched the free episode of For All Mankind, have you, on uh, Apple TV? No, although I did, did just claim my free year, so I've got a year to watch any of their stuff. Oh, you bought a new Apple device? Yes, how did you know? Because that's how you get a free yeah, year. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> um, 
Lost in Space, the revamp. Did you have you watched that? The the yes, the, the, there's a second series coming, isn't there? But which is why I'm rewatching the first series. Yeah, and I enjoyed that. I really enjoyed the first one, and it, even my mother enjoyed the uh, the remake. She doesn't normally like them, um, but she was a big a big fan, and she enjoyed uh, Will Robinson as well. She thought he was a good good actor. That's exactly what I was saying. And if only Lyra had been even three quarters as good as Will Robinson, <laughs> she would have been marvellous. But there you go. Oh, it's well. interesting. My my wife and my son are, are, have enjoyed the first three episodes of Lost in Space. Did they? My my mother liked the line when uh, Will turns up with the robot and says, "It's okay, he's with me," because uh, <laughs> she just thought that was such a nice moment for a, a boy to do something kind of grown up. Um, I don't know because that bit happened uh, while I was in bed. They they were watching it and I was having a lie in, and there was all this music going. On. I was thinking, what is that noise? And I got, up, I thought, oh no, I'm quite pleased they're watching Lost in Space. <laughs> <laughs> what about the Good Place? I recently started watching that. Yes, and uh, I, it's it's quite enjoyable actually. Sort of it's, non-committal it's, TV, which is quite nice. Uh, yeah, yeah, it really is. But it, it's it sort of weirdly lampoons itself because it's uh, uh, it's all that bright and uh, glaring colours and over sanitised landscapes and uh, world, which kind of almost mocks everything American like that. Mm. Uh, uh, and then the yeah, the writing's a bit smarter than your average American content. No offence to any of your American listeners, obviously. No, no offence. <laughs> no offence. <laughs> Insert offending uh, sentence. <laughs> yeah, I find it a little bit irritating, but then I, I, I sort of like it too. You know, I, yeah. Bite-sized size television is to be recommended. Uh, Voice to the bottom of the sea. Have you ever seen that? Never. I've got, well, you've got to see that. I've got a long list of nevers, which it's people are always shocked rubbish. that I've not seen these things. <laughs> it's, an, it's another Irwin Allen thing from the 60s. You know, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, starring mm. Richard Basehart and David Hedison. That's literally how it's announced at the beginning. All the credits are read out like a Quinn Martin production. What about Collateral? Did you ever see that? Nope. The David Hare thing. Oh, I spoke to you about that earlier. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you did. Because <laughs> I was going on about it. I'm yeah. nothing if not predictable. No, no, it, it's good. It's good you're predictable. Um, I'm trying to think what I've been watching uh, recently. Uh, um, it, uh, Explained on Is Netflix. That? Is it a drama? No, it's a little informational thing. It's sort of um, uh, little 20 minute things about various um, topics. Oh, I like um, stuff like that. It's They're really nice little bite sized things if you've got. Uh, sort of 15, 20 minutes and you want to, you know, not do anything else and you, or you want to do something non-committal. Right. Yeah. Mm. Ooh. Of course, uh, The Crown is, is coming on uh, Netflix now, isn't it? The new series of The Crown. Uh, another thing which I gave up on after the first series. I really... <laughs> I quite enjoyed it, but it just... Yeah, I'm, I, I was exactly the same. I enjoyed it, but I, I never, I didn't keep watching it. Really, I don't know. It was very good, though. Like, I can't fault it for being very good telly. Yeah. How, how strange! How strange. But just not interesting enough for you. It just didn't. I don't know. It didn't feel like enough of a build up that I really needed to break the tension and find a resolution in the second series. We were all waiting yeah. for the Queen to whip out a Karashnikov, wasn't it, and take out, you know, kind of a bunch of Russian spies. But it never happened. Yeah, because that happened. Yeah, that did. Yeah, it, was, it was a very, you know, iconic moment, really. So History. should we finish off with a, um, a a question for Jamie from the Random Question Generator? Yeah. Um, what would you say, uh, what can you do that you think you do better than 90% of other people? Oh, <laughs> uh, cook a steak really oh, wow really uh. what's your method <laughs> uh, my method is to take it out of the fridge at least yeah. an hour before cooking really yeah uh, a hot pan 
butter until the butter is just going brown, so it's a bit oh yeah burn noisette. Two minutes aside, ribeye, always ribeye. I'm not bothered about mm. other cuts. Uh, or ha- having salted it before, but just with table salt, none of the crystal stuff. Take it out, rest it, minimum three minutes, then slice it, and then a bit of sea salt across the top. Magic. It does sound yeah. really not. I'm quite, I quite fancy a I'm steak. I'm really now. hungry now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ooh, yes. It's really, well, really quite something. Well, I think um, one thing we should touch upon... Um, yes. Before we end this podcast, is that last yes. week, Nick, you were disappointed because we couldn't talk about the fact that we had the idea, didn't we, to do a, a little retreat? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so do explain more. Uh, well, that's it. You know, the, the three of us, or maybe four of us, get Richard from the uh, uh, Jerry Anderson podcast <laughs> to, to come along as well. Jamie's laughing in a very embarrassed way. Like no, he, no, no. He's it's never because, going to do it. It's because we, we've had this... Well, you dropped this in, very, you know, a uh, little teaser with me privately. Uh, yes. And obviously then I, you know, s- saw what Richard uh, suggested. And he, he gave me a really quizzical look for quite a while. And I thought he was going to go, no, get lost. I'm not going on holiday with that with those uh, pair of, uh, <laughs> you know... Uh, podcasters and uh, no, <laughs> they're he, right podcasters he actually decided that it would be rather marvellous uh, especially if um, we could have curry and beer oh, oh the stuff of the gods the stuff of the gods <laughs> yeah yeah so exactly stuffing the gods we have to find a location yes I it's did, not going to happen before Christmas it's not it? for Christmas but I did think possibly uh, <laughs> Foxley Manor Where's that? Which is it's it's the vicarage from the Secret Service. Oh, <gasps> can you can stay you there? Rent? Is it on? <laughs> yes, is it can. on B- Airbnb? I don't know, but I'm in touch with the owner, and she, they do all sorts of kind of retreats and yoga holidays and rent, renting out and B and B and stuff. So it might be quite a fun topical location to go. That would wow. be brilliant, <laughs> wouldn't it? What Look into fun. that. And we can recreate the. Stanley Unwin at uh, the window. Looking out the window, yes. that window still see how, exists. See how close the back of the room is, because it's... <laughs> 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 if anyone remembers that odd reference. Well, that's quite exciting, isn't it? That's a really By the way, idea. Benji, do you think there's anything you can do um, better than 90% of other people? Better than 90%? Um, I can do a pretty mean mouth trumpet, actually. Do you? Like, yeah, you know, we got... And then you can do the... All that sort of fun stuff. That's quite good. I can't do the. Can't do that. Sorry. Can you do it, Jamie? <laughs> no, I was going to do my my water drop uh, sound. Go on, do that. that. Benji already does that really well. So, yeah, it's a good one. I can't do it now. Yeah, do you know, I actually well, used that good. in an audio drama um, that I've just done the sound for. It just hurts my face. When somebody was dropping some sugar cubes into a, a cup of tea, that was me going, yeah. like that. Nice. Oh, lovely. It's real sugar cubes, but they don't make any noise. So I thought, oh, I can't have that. So I, got, so I over, can't over have the that. top it's of it. It's an audio drama, up. isn't it? Yeah, you know, you can't have, you can't have somebody dropping mm. something into liquid without, you know, it doesn't make any sense, does it? I wonder what I can do better than 90% of other people. Hmm. Touch type? Yeah, you're a very good touch typer. Yeah. Do you touch type, Jamie? Uh, I remember <laughs> I remember doing Mavis Beacon. Uh, Mavis Beacon! <laughs> oh, many years ago oh, my to learn. Gosh, I actually don't know what you mean. Me but back. Uh, good. Oh. Mavis, Mavis Beacon, it was a software thing, but she was the character who yeah. taught you to type. Right. And I, I spent a lot of time doing doing it to start with, and I kind of gave up after about fifty five percent of the course, and so I've got this right. kind of half touch half type half. thing. Right. Gosh, yeah. that's just brought you just brought I'm back sure a so lot of many memories of, of BBC. Is it Acorn Computers or something or whatever they were called? <laughs> BBC Micro. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the dream, isn't it? Yeah. There you go. You can go and look on YouTube for maybe speaking teachers typing, and uh, you can see yeah. see what she looked like fictionally. Um, so true. Mm. Crazy. A Dalek yeah. voice, I suppose. Yeah, I was going to yes. say Dalek or J- Jadoon. You're a yeah. You're, that's a, true. you're a mean Jadooner, aren't you? 
yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, um, Benji and I were talking about a series earlier that we think we might watch for next week. Crime Traveller. Did you ever see that? No. You're really. It was. It was universally hated, mainly because it wasn't Doctor Who, and they made it when they weren't making Doctor Who at the BBC. I'm just looking it up. Uh, and at SFX, they did a, a thing where they used to give previously believed rubbish series a second chance for a reassessment. And they did Crime Traveler on one page. They put Crime Traveler. When you turn the page, it just said, no way. <laughs> and that was it. So that's how badly Crime Traveler is thought of. Gosh, I'm just looking at the Amazon reviews. And, uh, yeah. The, well, this one should uh, put you in good stead for your review, if you're, uh, if you're viewing. What a load of garbage. Childish, <laughs> unbelievable stories, and whoever put them on DVD should have left them on the original format so to stretch them out so everyone looks three foot tall and four <laughs> foot wide. <laughs> so if you're watching the DVDs, be warned. OK, well, bear that yes. in mind. Oh, and also, here's, here's one. Uh, I remember watching this on TV, and I also remember it being one of the worst TV shows ever to air on <laughs> British television. <laughs> Oh, that's, I love it. So there you go, Benji. <laughs> Thanks for condemning us to that. <laughs> oh, Good dear. luck. I would just say at this juncture, don't forget to write in to podcast at nicholasbriggs.com with your comments or anything you flipping well like. In the meantime, uh, this is me getting very close to the microphone. Uh, Jamie, can you do that? I'm can you joining get close you, to yes. I'm right by it. Oh, lovely, yes. I'm, Mavis I'm Beacon. saying... I'm saying... <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a very odd location. Now, we need to film that up at Mavis Beacon. Um, anyway, uh, and cue, cue me saying goodbye. Cue me saying goodbye. And I guess cue me saying goodbye. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. <laughs> they used to do those lion noises by doing it into a bin, didn't they? To give it that... <laughs> I saw a guy doing... I don't know... <laughs> It does work, doesn't it? Yeah. Pressing stop now, ka-chunk.